is it reasonable for you? I mean, the extension of the lockdown, is it, is it reasonable? Yes, you know, uh, of course, we are frustrated because the, our health department started to ramp up, ramp up testing one month after the lockdown. In fact, I, I envy Thailand. You were saying you have 20,000 tests a day, right? Here in the yeah, Philippines, yeah. we're only doing, as of now, 3,000 tests a day. Oh. And then mm -hmm. by the end of April, uh, about 8,000 tests a day. So yeah. uh, you're still lucky, I mean, compared to the Philippines. You said the situation in Manila and in the Philippines is worsening. Yes, so I was saying that the Department of Health did not anticipate this um, situation. You know that uh, in late February, uh, about late February, the, our health secretary already said that the Philippines is a model in containing the coronavirus because at that time there was no local transmission yet. Our first local transmission happened on March 6th. So mm -hmm. they did not plan. I think they were too confident because it took a while before we had local transmission. So we did not respond early, unlike uh, other countries. Uh, we did not shut down immediately our borders. So now we're, we're paying for the delay. So mm -hmm. we have no choice, but uh, we are cooperating. Uh, this is our sixth week of lockdown here in Metro Manila and, and Luzon. President Duterte was very aggressive, Marites, because he told the whole country about on the 2nd of April, shoot them down if anyone violate the lockdown. Has he shot anyone yet? The UN Secretary General said he reminded uh, leaders, heads of state, that the enemy is not people, it's the virus. So that's why we're also a bit apprehensive here in the Philippines because of situations like that. And some people were also arrested because they, the police said that they belong to the left, uh, the left-wing organizations in the Philippines. But this, these people were distributing relief goods so you know that this situation can also be used, this emergency can be used to go against um, perceived enemies of the state. Uh, uh, Meritus, the, the Philippines Congress has passed the, an emergency law, right, uh, which will be used to, to tighten the, the lockdown. But you yourself have expressed concern of the potential for the law to be abused by the authorities to clamp down on press freedoms or on critics of the government. Has this happened? Has your fears materialized? Uh, the law is good for three months. You know, mm -hmm. what's worrisome about this law is that there is a provision uh, that is punishing, that will punish fake news. So already 17 people, uh, not journalists, but 17 netizens have been summoned by the National Bureau of Investigation because they were um, told that they posted fake news. But you know, nowadays, who says what is fake news but the government? Uh, <laughs> so that's worrisome for us. But this law will end after three months. So we hope that there will be no convictions and we hope that uh, the Congress will not extend this uh, emergency law. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It seems the measure is ve are very strict and been imposed quite very heavily. How has your life changed, Marites, and how, how do you survive? Oh no, uh, as well as journalists, we also now are under lockdown, <laughs> except uh -huh. the reporters to go uh, on the field. But uh, I think what's a chilling effect is for those who are very active on social media because that's where you air your views, your opinions, sometimes you use satire. And there was one artist in Cebu, this is a city in the Visayas outside uh, Metro Manila. She was arrested uh, because she posted a very satirical 
a note on Facebook saying that their city is now the epicenter of the pandemic in the entire solar system. Uh, Maritis, when you, you were talking about fake news in the Philippines, and uh, you were quoted in a recent interview as saying that the government is now the biggest source of fake news. What do you mean by that? Well, I said that the main, I think the main source of this information is the president of the Philippines and also <laughs> his health secretary. You know, with Dr. Uh, Rappler, uh, the news website I work for, and Verifiles, another independent news organization, both have documented statements of the president and the health secretary, which are inaccurate or may plainly uh, false. For example, let me just tell you this. President Duterte said that uh, the coronavirus will just go away, like HIV. And that's not true. And then he also said that he was the first country, the first leader to declare, to impose lockdown. That's not also true. Some other countries were ahead of him. You know, so things like that, they have already been uh, reported, they have been fact-checked. And also our health secretary said that we have one of the relatively low infection rates. It's because we're not testing enough. So uh, things like that have already been fact-checked. So we're, that is quite worrisome because, you know, we're learning from South Korea, the foreign secretary minister said transparency is one of the best uh, tools in fighting uh, the pandemic, you know, by giving information, by letting the public know what's really happening. Besides the false uh, statements that uh, the president has made, as you mentioned, but how do you see his handling of this whole situation? Is he in charge? Well, uh, uh, he, ha he, he formed an interagency task force headed by the health department uh, and many secretaries, many department secretaries. So I think this task force is the one that's really making the decisions and recommendations. And then uh, the president approves these recommendations. So in terms of uh, doing the work, it's really the task force, which consulted also recently with uh, health experts, medical experts, and also academics uh, who have been studying this. So finally, finally government is consulting uh, experts, scientists, because in the beginning we missed that. We were looking for information based on science, but now finally we're, they, they've been talking, government has been talking to them. What's the economic impact in the Philippines right now, Marites? Oh yes, that's, you know, that's one big worry. In fact, our finance secretary said that you know, we're running out of funds. Even the president said that, Duterte said this morning. He said, we're running low. The Philippines is borrowing from the World Bank. And I think also other multilateral institutions, this big business, or not just big business, small and medium enterprises are already suffering. So they're all awaiting partial reopening of the economy after May 15. In other provinces in the Philippines, uh, some have, can, they can already start to reopen after April 30. But most of us, Metro Manila, the surrounding areas, the big cities, have still to remain closed until May 15. It's very serious situation of lockdown and can you tell us what's the popularity of President Duterte right now? Has it been changed a lot by this situation? I, I, just, I just saw a Gallup poll, which did a survey of the Philippines, Malaysia, and I think Thailand. They did not ask about Duterte. They just asked about, are you satisfied with the government response to the pandemic? And here it's quite high in the Philippines, 80 percent if I recall right. Uh, there was no specific mention of the name of the president, but that I think reflects also uh, the president's performance. So 
It was an online poll, so I don't know the sampling yeah. done by this online poll. Yes. The, and and how are the media in the Philippines doing in general in covering the pandemic? Uh, they have access to information that uh, is crucial to the public. Well, the daily we have daily briefings by the Department of Health, by the task force. So, in fairness to the government, every day they uh, do briefings. The difficulty is these are virtual briefings. So, the mm -hmm. questions, you know, you in a real live uh, press conference you can follow up you can keep yeah. following up uh, questions but in a virtual press con you know the, the questions are sent by email and then you know there's not enough time and sometimes the department of health does not answer all your questions especially those that point out inconsistencies in their data you know so it's a bit difficult but generally we get the information